Uh, Luca Nation, hope you enjoyed yesterday's uh, debate-driven episode of Lucas Tigers and Bronze Online. I think this is 9-19. Oh, congrats. He, he, LeBron broke the record. Uh, interesting game. AD was kind of un- unhappy on the bench. Westbrook was trying to win. LeBron had a 20-minute celebration, so we'll get into that. <laughs> you don't like the celebration, huh? You don't like the celebration at all. I thought that was the most outrageous thing I've seen in a long time in, in, in <laughs> any sporting event, but I understand why. I understand why. Um, I mean, I, 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 under, you, I understand the validity to it. I mean, I watched the Kareem one. There was a little celebration, but the difference between Kareem doing it is that, you know, that Laker team when he did it was en route to uh, the finals. <laughs> he did it in a meaningful game. It was a meaningful bucket, um, you know, and this one seemed to be like, all right, you know, Cam Thomas played more meaningful minutes last night, you know? No? Let's say, so like, Too soon. I've never had kids, but let's say you have a kid, right? And mm-hmm. anytime you go grocery shopping with him, you know, you guys buy Gushers at the store, you say, okay, you can only eat one pack of Gushers, mm-hmm. right? But every day he eats one pack of Gushers, goes to sleep, and you then you wake up and there's like wrappers in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. You knew he snuck in at night, right? Yeah. And he keeps doing that and doing that. You would be surprised if he doesn't do that. So that's the story with LeBron to me. It's I'm surprised he doesn't care more about winning. But to be quite honest, he's always cared about himself, his image, his stats, how he's viewed in legacy. And winning has always, to me, appeared to come second to him. So I was surprised that when the game mattered, when the game was within reach after the celebration – he didn't want to kind of like put that stamp on it and say, like, I also won the game instead of losing to. Uh, right. I mean, he had 36 OKC. at the end of the third quarter, made it close. It was a close enough game. I mean, obviously, he got a little out of hand there in the middle of the court, but you figure, all right, wow, he could drop 50 and a 50 that's needed from him to go out there and get a win. Six rookies and four vets, uh, <laughs> four sophomores on that OKC team. But Luke not very so, good. It's you know? a good team. Actually, they play good ball. They no, the Lakers, the, ball the Lakers, the oh. Lakers, the Lakers. I'm talking about the Lakers. Don't hate on my OKC team. I mean, you know, Dort going down hurts them. But, I mean, listen, it's all about the team. It's all about the partnerships, man. That's what it's all about. It's all about what kind of team and can you make your partners and your teammates better? Yeah. Is that, so, that's the legacy, man. LeBron's not doing it. I think Andrew does. That's that's right. So we Cage mentioned we have news. We have news. Cage will elaborate on it. But basically, we're partnering with Beckett for the year oh, 2023. Yeah. C- Cage always thinks I'm going to cliffhang it. I'm not. Um, Never. It, it, it's an interesting partnership, guys. It's one that, you know, we've been doing the show for three years. It's one that we've actually thought about for two months now. Yep. Because with any partnership, what we've realized is we've gone through this we're putting our name, we're putting our stamp of approval on the business, the service, the good, whatever it is. And we want to partner with the best. We really do. And we want to help people grow their businesses, grow their mission. And Beckett has been synonymous with card grading since the get. And we all know during COVID, maybe they lost their way, maybe who knows a bunch of reasons, but we want to help them kind of get back to the peak. And this partnership for the next year is going to look like that. But the reality is when we go into all these partnerships, we ask what's in it for our community. So here's what's in it for you guys. We're working on free grading the same way we're doing, we did it last year. We're working on that. So you'll you'll have more information on that. Um, we're cognizant of turnaround times and our responsibility to you guys and getting your cards back in a timely manner. So we're thinking through that very diligently. Discounts, new opportunities, uh, ticket grading, things like that. Any discounts, opportunities you guys will have, you'll hear it from us. You'll have people on the show. And... Other than that, it'll be business as usual. So We're ready now for the clippable, commercial, professionally done. I love Andrew's enthusiasm and you know, just organic here. I mean, I've been using Beckett for a long time, and you know, we're not coming on here to you today to tell you, okay, you know, Beckett's Beckett is the only thing you should ever use. You guys know us better than that. We've never done that with any of the grading partners we've had. We've never done that with any of the partners we have. You know, we are sponsored by PWCC, and I tell you about how we have great experiences with Probstein, and we tell you how I'm selling cards with Golden. Um, you know, certain things do well certain places. But I will tell you, Beckett holds a special place in the heart of a lot of collectors, including myself. I remember getting my first Beckett magazine. I remember, you know, waiting for it to show up every month um, to look at which cards had the up arrows, which one had the down. And... You know, we talk about kind of like for the good of the hobby, you know, like growing the hobby pie and all that stuff. Beckett is one of those brands that is a legacy hobby brand to me. 
And I think the hobby is better if Beckett is better. And that's kind of the what we came into the conversations, the discussions with Beckett about. And um, I really do believe that, um, you know, with some feedback from you guys, the listeners, the true collectors, that, you know, Beckett can get on the road towards, you know, the, 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 the name you know, right? I mean, that's kind of where I would go with it, right? So we're announcing a year-long strategic partnership with them that enables collectors and hobbyists across the community to get an inside look into Beckett's new leadership, their business plans, and their operational improvements. And we'll position Beckett as the official grading partner of Luca Nation. There's the key. There's the commercial. There's the fun. What does it mean? Well, one of the cool things that you know is you want to know who you're dealing with. You want to know who's behind the curtain, right? When you're handing over your assets, when you're handing over your cards, you're trusting this, this item you've invested in, the ticket, VHS, whatever it may be. You want to know who you're giving it to. Right? You want to see a face. You want to talk to the people behind the brand and know that you can trust that it's coming back to you and it's going to, you know, it's going to be um, in good hands. Well, we're going to show you whose hands it's in. We're going to, we're going to have on the show um, you know, people from Beckett who are going to tell you about the improvements that they have going on there, their business plans, what they plan to change, what they plan to do in 2023. And more importantly, because we get to talk to you guys and because we have an open line of communication through Instagram, through YouTube comments, you're watching this and you want to tell Beckett something, put it in the comments. We'll make sure they hear it this week. They are very open to the community. One of the greatest things I think we built, if not the greatest thing we've built here with Luca Nation is this community, community of rabid collectors, not a vanilla community. Some people love vintage cards. Some people love ultra modern. Some people love... Uh, you know, patch autos. Some people love shiny cards. Some people want to collect everyone type loves, one Everyone has big opinions, though. Yeah, yeah. And they have some people love LeBron and some people hate LeBron. Some people love Kobe and think he's top five. And then there are people who know the truth. So the point here, of course, is yeah, I got it in there, is that it's going to be a two way street, man. It's going to be a two way street because I think Beckett improving happens when they know what they need to improve on. And they're going to know that because they're going to hear it from you guys. So a couple of fun things Andrew touched on it already as part of this partnership. All of our listeners are going to receive exclusive discounts across several Beckett services, including cards, tickets, VHS grading. Stay tuned to obviously future episodes. We'll have them on. We'll promote them. Um, and, you know, we are going to also, you know, have an exclusive clubhouse sometime in the next couple of weeks, um, you know, to connect with, collectors and have Beckett on there answering questions, question and answer, no hiding. That's kind of what we do, right? I mean, one of the things you know about us is, you know, I give a bad take. You know, I go out there and say Brady is coming to the 49ers and he literally retires three hours later. Well, I can't hide. I got to do an episode the next day. You guys come on, hit the comments, you know, go ahead and, and do this. Nobody can hide. Nobody needs to hide. You know, you want to be able to have direct access to these people. And that's where it's going to be. You have question and answer. We'll have them on the show and do lives. We're going to have them on Clubhouse and do lives. Um, and basically, that's the gist of it. 2023, you're going to hear more about, you know, the changes at Beckett, the updates at Beckett. You'll hear more announcements at Beckett. Two of them, I can tell you right off the bat right now. Um, one, you can check it out in my story and we'll repost it also on the, on the main page. They have a really cool promotion going on right now for LeBron. Um, you know, you actually win a LeBron card from them. It, you know, if you submit, I think it's in the next six days now that LeBron's got the, you know, got the, the scoring title. So you can take a look at that one and they're going to be at Burbank this weekend. You know, Burbank show up, you're going to be there. They are doing on-site grading. You bring a card, it's graded right there on site at the show which is, you know, it adds a real layer of liquidity, a real layer of fun to a show. You buy a raw card there, bring it over, get it graded, and instantly can add some value to the card right there at the show. These and shows have a lot of pull power, huh? Oh, yeah. Like, these shows, uh, I'm starting to, um, a lot because, Cage, if you think about it, a lot of these shows started in, during, like, right at the tail end of COVID, right? Yep. Culture Clutch was their third time around. And yep. it's cool to watch them all improve and and, yeah. and have pull and, Hey, back at PSA, you have to be grading on site. Like, think about that for Burbank, second time doing this, having that kind of leverage and pull power. And in theory, if you think about the, the shows, the, the shows are supposed to be for the people. They're supposed to be sort of a voice uh, for the people. So it's cool to see if you guys are going to Burbank, enjoy. Um, well, the show thing, what's funny about it is we have a show, a topic where we talk about all oh, that too many shows. Can all these shows survive? What's the story? And what's funny about it is, you know, not all the shows may survive. You know what's happening? Because we have all of these shows, they're making each other better. 
They're Agreed. building. And I think the question survive. I'd like to touch on that. Shoot. Well, they're making each other better. So yeah. the whole show survive thing is, I, I, as you go through a business, you obviously learn like the business mechanics. Like the concept of running a show, really your overhead, I imagine, is the space for the day or for the weekend, which you you know, and you offset that with sponsorships. So you're going in with a pretty clear black and white formula of what you need, what your cost is to recoup. So these shows to survive, the, as easy as it is to become a group supper, it is also easy to put on a good a show. Now, it's not easy to put on a good show. So the whole show, show to survive, I, I think you could start a show in two minutes. You know, you rent a space, you put a billboard, and you say, hey, come to my show. You yes. start to put on a good show. But if a show isn't good, it won't survive. I mean, that's kind of the deal. You, you know, you, you got to get dealers there. And you got to you got to also you're get sponsors to be there, and that depends on foot traffic. It depends on advertising. When I think of survive, I think of businesses that like raise money to like start a mission, and they fail, and they lose a lot of money along the way. I guess that's not how part of my. Mind. I mean, I have a different um, you know insight into it because I talk to Black Jane Wolf on my show, and you know she basically will break down. All right, which show am I going to go to this weekend? If there are competing shows, I can only commit to one or I have to split my resources up to one and it costs a lot of money. Where am I going to travel? And what am I going to do? And basically, that is what the show person has to deal with, right? How are you going to get the person there? And the way you do it is there's going to be foot traffic. There's going to be sponsors there. There's going to be businesses there. There's going to be, you know, what are the offerings that are going to be there? And, you know, how do you convince a Beckett to bring their on-site grading, which they've only done, I think, at National? You know what I mean? How do you, how, how do you, how, that's a, that's an expense. That's a major expense. For a company to do that, for you know, uh, PSA is doing it at Mint Collective, right? And they do it at, at at National itself, right? So they're obviously not doing that at every show. You know, what does the show give them? Does the show give them free space? I, it's a fun thing, man. I mean, I, I know, I know, we look on the outside and think like, wow, I'm just going to rent some space, and I'm going to say, here you go, tables, sponsors. I don't think it's that easy. Imagine if somebody came to you and said, hey, this podcast you run is pretty easy. Just talk. It is easy. And get some it's sponsors. A, well, that's it, easy. You want to jump off a bridge. <laughs> he doesn't listen. I don't know how I've done this. I realized recently he doesn't. It's easy to start. Like the, the barrier to entry is super simple. You, yeah. you buy a camera, you buy a microphone, and you go. Now to do a good podcast, that's a different game. Same thing with the show was my point. So the I, barrier to entry where it's a lot harder to build. I do uh, listen. PWCC. I try to see. I try to all. save our audience. If I say, oh, the show's going to survive, I think it's baked in that it means good shows. I'm not talking about the local VFW yeah. show. It's baked in. You know, I Let mean, me like, ask why are question. we even spending two minutes on, hey, it's very easy to start a podcast. I can talk to myself and the camera in my basement. Yeah, but anybody that's about- listen. So, listen, question. You've been doing the show with Black Jade Bull for, has it been three months? Two months? Yeah. Yeah. For me, this has been the most challenging card environment in my three, four years of this. So right. it's very unpredictable. If we kind of just like go back to right after National, there was this uncertainty of really difficult period to liquidate cards. And it looks like, you know, we saw that storm, we saw that hurricane, but the sun is rising right over the clouds. That That's what January and February feels like. You feel a little bit more volume, a little bit more buyers, a little more activity. What have you learned from the last three months with Black Jade and Wolf on the market? And what do you prognosticate maybe the next six months might look like? To succeed in the hobby, you have to be very, very nimble if that's going to be your business. That's what I learned from Black Jade and Wolf because every week she goes to a show and has to basically reinvent what her inventory is going to be to succeed at that show. And it's funny because what I learned from that is, I don't know if you remember this, but I mean, I come on this uh, and I do episodes after I go to shows and I come back in sometimes. I'm like, why do I even go to the show? Why why, why, why do I even waste my time? I'll just go on eBay. It's not going to have, no one's going to have anything there for me. Right. And what I learned from talking to Black Jane Wolf is just the shows that I go to, the vast majority of dealers are literally bringing the same stale inventory every single show. 
They're there every show with the same cards. I walk by their table. They haven't refreshed it. They haven't done anything new. They haven't changed anything. They haven't done a thing at all to their showcase. And, and how would they refresh the inventory? Like, is that how she got what a doing very good whole, question? The well, wholesale she, deals. She has more inventory, so it depends on what show it is, right? So she's going to go to a show where she knows that there are repack people, and she's going to bring repack stuff. She's going to go to Boston, and she's going to stock the thing full of. New England Patriots and Boston Celtics cards, and she's going to have different inventory for different shows. These people, they don't go to other shows. They just stay here, and they're trying to get rid of their inventory, and their hope is that a different person, unlike me, who's already seen their inventory, is going to show up. They lean more on, oh, the show promoter. Go get more foot traffic in here. I'll get more people in. It's funny because it shouldn't have taken Sharon to explain that to me. I remember selling cards myself when I was a teenager on – Broadway in the city, right by the stock exchange, right by right up Wall Street. And I remember setting up there for the summer with my collection. And every day I would come in for a few hours during the lunch break. The guys would come out. I'd set up next to guys with wax. They were selling packs of cards and stuff. And I'd sell. I this set up like in and, an office building. No, it was on the street. It was on Broadway. Was on the street, right, right by Zuccotti Park. That's where the guys moved. Yeah. So it was on the street. Like yeah, like a, just had, like a little table, like a, they like had a table. Foldable. One guy set up with had a permit, like a street vending permit, and I set up right next to him. And I put a showcase out on the table, and I remember it was before, before this I went is to downtown Manhattan. Downtown Manhattan, right off, or right off, right, right before you get to Wall Street on Broadway. You know, oh, like there's a subway station to right there. school, like where you would go home after. This was school the summer. There. This was the summer. And I would take my cards with me in a showcase with like a wheelie thing. You know, okay. like you, before you had like rolly suitcases. It was like one of those metal wheelie things with a showcase and a cardboard box of cards. I would take it on the stand on a ferry with me. I'd get off the ferry and I'd walk up Broadway past the bull. And I'd walk up to where this was. And I'd get there you know, about 11 o'clock, 1130. I'd I'd get love, there this is an table. image. I would love to see this image. I would love to see Little Cage. With like this wheelie and the bulls right there. That that's the that's the. I passed the bull. No, but the point was, after a couple of weeks, I stopped making money. I wow. didn't understand it, and the one, the guy I was set up with, he's like, "Well, everybody bought everything from your showcase that they were going to buy, and you're setting up here with the same people. Like you're not going to you might get a passerby, but they're not passing by on on Broadway looking to buy your cards. The guys. So what do you do with that dead inventory? So. At the time, I would take the – what I learned to do was I took that inventory to a card store, and it was not great stuff. So I sold it to the guy in the store for what I remembered the people were buying. One guy was a Shaq fan. One guy was a Michael Jordan 91 Upper Deck fan. Weird. Like holograms. You know, one guy – like so so I would I would trade my stuff in. Sometimes at you know a loss, but I really didn't care because this was dead stuff that I couldn't sell anyway. I'd get new stuff. I also would open packs and you know hope. And if I got a cool hit, I'd put that in there. But the what the lesson that I learned was you had to churn your inventory. You can't keep putting the same stuff out in front of the same people. So I've learned this from Sharon to be successful at a show. You have to know what the show is ahead of time and you have to really change what you're bringing to these shows right and and the dealers who are in it the dealers who are constantly changing and putting story sales and i got this card coming and look at sasha t i don't see as much posts from him anymore i see him eating dinner with people but other than that I don't, but hey look i got this luca i got this zion i, I got don't this understand boat. why people have to catch trays i'm saying he does a good job because he's okay, churning he's his dinner. inventory i have two questions on that so he can't hide that. What so he can't hide with that beard. What I'm hearing is you got to turn inventory. Yeah. And doing I'm that. I'm glad you heard that. I said like, it like six times. Listen, just <laughs> listen. Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm waiting for you to make a point by, that's worth listening to. It's hard to do that by selling through auction houses and even through eBay. So it, by understanding that and saying in the next few months, we, people are going to need to turn inventory, aren't shows in a better position? Because by going to shows, it's where you can share an inventory. So you hope people no, will be forced. No, only good shows. <laughs> it was implied. Good. Only good shows. That's it. The show has to be good. So won't people sort of be forced by because of the difficulty of selling online to now go to shows to turn inventory? And mm -hmm. second question, two part question: that will we eventually just see dealers selling to dealers? So this is why the shows that will survive will be the good shows. <laughs> See, that's all I have to say.
And okay, you know, that's so I have another the point of what a good show is is that the dealers are going to rely on the show promoters who get different people in based on different promotions, people who are going to see their inventory, and yeah, they're also going to want to be the ones who do enough of the show that they attract the more active dealers. You can fill that room, the barrier to entry you talk about. Like, I could fill a room with a card show. With the same guys who go to every single show out here with the same cards. And you know what's going to happen? They're not going to sell anything. And they're going to complain and say, I put on a shitty show and I didn't get great foot traffic for that. Let me get to my point and then maybe it'll help. So sure. I'm seeing these two forces colliding right now. So two I'm forces. seeing a hobby that's truly growing in participation, in active participation. Uh, in people from, you know, that are starting businesses to also people that are buying cards. So I'm seeing one side this from you know the covid ruin or rubble a you know a, a fire like a lot of people are in it and a lot of people love it and i i feel like that audience is growing and is more passionate than it was in 2019 at the same time i see eggs that cost eight dollars bread costs five dollars travel costs very expensive uh and i'm seeing these forces uh interest rates going up like you know we saw cards appreciate tremendously but we, we forget that also homes appreciated tremendously. Cards have corrected. You know, you see a, a lot of cards are down 80, 90%, 50%, 30%. Homes haven't gone through that. So people still feel a little bit wealthy and homes always take longer. So I'm seeing this economic struggle, difficult time coming as it's hitting an industry that's very strong, very engaged. And I'm curious what's going to come from that. Okay. That's what you're seeing. I listen That's a gr do, do you agree, disagree? You want to poke any holes? That was a per uh, What do I agree? That's what you're seeing. I agree that's what you're seeing. <laughs> I listened. What would you like me to tell you? Cage that's is what that you're seeing. If, if you say something to him during the show, he could be stuck on that way. He is an elephant. He will not forget about that don't listen I mean, comment. So what you're saying is there are people who got pummeled during covid and they're leaving and there are people no, i didn't who... say that i actually said the complete opposite Ooh. i said that there are people that joined during covid and the, the hobby is engaged and passionate uh as it's ever been simultaneously cost of living is going up so people who want to spend more on cards be go to more shows also have this other factor and, and it, i'm interested how it's going to play out this year economically speaking so you want to watch that the people who stayed, we're going to forget about the people who left because it doesn't matter how much they're paying for eggs. The people who stayed, you want to see whether they continue to stay because uh, things cost more money now and they might not have money to spend on cards. Like, wh where's the point go? You want to watch what happens. Yes? So, I like it. You want to watch what happens. I I I'll cards? tell you. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. I'm listening. <laughs> You're such an asshole. Um, the last two years, your Jordan card got up yep. to seven hundred fifty. Yeah, not mine. Now it's Some probably two hundred thousand dollar card. Uh -huh. And a lot of people are curious. They might be owning that card. They might be thinking of buying that card, or they're just watching the Jordan market. It's what is going to happen next with that card, mm -hmm. and that depends on two things: supply and demand. Yep. So I'm seeing demand in this hobby growing every single day, not just more people more people spending more time and more of their dollars in the hobby. But I'm also seeing a supply increase of cards and cost of living go up. So I'm wondering for people who are listening, what do you think is going to happen with that Jordan card? Do you think oh, in the next six okay. months, that's a hundred thousand dollar card, a hundred fifty thousand dollar card, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar card. And what does that say for the rest of the market? Let's forget about the Jordan for a second and talk about your premise of January, February. The market's looking better. Everything's looking great. There's more people, more confidence. It's more fun. It's gotten past the hill. I think this is a head fake. I think it's a tremendous head fake, and it's the same type of head fake we've seen in January and February previously. Um, and I think that it's one last head fake up before another rip down. And I think you're going to see that with the people who are holding the NFL quarterbacks now who are expecting to see a bump up after the Super Bowl, and that's not going to happen. And I think that if you um, if you look at the numbers, while, yes, there's more volume, there's more frothiness, there's more positivity, it's in a very small segment of buying. 
And I think the high end, which was the stuff that drove the craziness, the stuff that got Yahoo News headlines, the stuff that got mainstream attention and got more people into, oh, wow, cards are worth money again? The Charizard sold for what? The Jordan sold for the, that LeBron record price sold for how much? You're not seeing that anymore. Instead, what you're seeing is those cards that sold for more money seem to, every time they sell, sell for less and less money. Now, I'd love to say maybe a floor is in and we're starting to see those things pick back up. That's not what I have seen so far. That could change. Instead, what I'm seeing is that where people used to play in a certain segment, they're now playing in a lesser segment. And we talk about this again with with you know with with Sharon with is it, Wolf. Instead of holding a ten thousand dollar card, you want to hold five two thousand dollar cards. You know? So I have a I have a question on that. Shoot. Is it not better to just hold cash? It could be. Uh, who was and it just, that came out the other day and said cash is uh, cash is a good a good place to hold? One of one of your financial guys who has previously hated cash. I forget who the hell it was. The, the, these guys always, you know, they, they yeah, always sway back and forth. But I, but I always love to have these the, the discussions, these debates, because you know I know it's a you timing the market, time in the market, but I just I think it's a head fake as well. And I'm wondering, what do I do with my inventory? What does someone listening do with their inventory? You know, they might have, you know, 5,000 in Jalen Hurts, you know, a few J John Moran cards, you know, 50, $75,000 in cards. You know, are they holding? Are they buying? Do you maybe, do they sell half their inventory and sit on cash? I, I, that, that's what I'm curious about. I'm curious what this little head fake will mean. A lot of people are like, we're now in a bull market. Crypto is now a great buy. Stocks are doing. I'm, I wanted to get your take because I know you always have a pulse. On you know, then we agree, a head fake. But I think it, we, we are remiss if we just go continue to go down this line. There are people listening to this that aren't worried about what Jaren, Jalen Hurts sold for last week and what he's going to sell for next week because they are collecting Jalen Hurts cards and they just want to own his cards. And I think a lot of the conversations that have, you know, um, come into this hobby for sports cards investors, you know, the kind of conversation we just had, which is, well, people are sitting there. They've got five grand invested in Jalen Hurts. That wasn't the conversation you heard five years ago. It, well, because Jalen Hurts wasn't playing, but you know what I'm saying. People would say, hey, I own a bunch of Jalen Hurts cards. I love it. Here's my Jalen Hurts collection. It wasn't quantified saying, I have a portfolio that includes 5,000 of Jalen Hurts. What should I be doing with it now? Because I don't want that 5,000 of Jalen Hurts to be worth 3,500 in two weeks. You know, and I do I saw it. A guy, I saw that tweet like um... – I can't believe Jalen Hurts cards are down the last six months. And what it got me thinking, because that's not true. They're not. They're not. Um, not. But cards are not liquid. So your buy-in point dictates if your card is up or down. Yep. You could have just bought wrong, and yep. you would have bought the right guy. You just overpaid for that card, or you bought the wrong card. And, and cards aren't meant to be investments. Card, card, cards are just, they're not meant. And I, I'll explain what I mean by that by watching the Cam Thomas thing. Mm -hmm. I think because of the so much supply in the market, it's almost impossible right now to move the needle on cards. Because as soon as Cam Thomas has three 40 point games and he becomes a bot, yeah, a few people liquidate their National Treasures cards. Okay. But most of it is just a bunch of mosaic and select and clearly done risk. And apparently there's now photogenic autos, which are kind of nice. But then I look, and you know how many photogenic autos there were? Tons of them. How are you going to invest in that? There's just a whole mishpash of cards hitting the market at the exact same time of any player. People waiting to liquidate. People didn't even grade Cam Thomas anymore. How many of those are now going to be a PSA? And by the time they get back? He might be a bench player again. Now these people have lost grading fees. Yeah. So that's that's a little bit. I love it. Any go, a step, go, go a step further. Go a step further with it. What you're talking about is what makes something collectible, what makes something valuable, right? That's two different conversations. Okay. And a lot of the things that have the most value as collectibles were things that when they were created, when they were made, they were not being collected. You know, you know, people try to make things out of it, but the iPhone is a fun example, right? The original iPhone is now people paying thirty, fifty thousand dollars for original iPhone. Be careful, Apple can't confirm that that shrink wrap around it is actually Apple because the initial iPhones were not done with what any happened? kind of proprietary give, give Apple. Give people the story. 
the there'll be people out there who sell these things that won't, won't like this and tell me I'm wrong. But look, the Apple iPhone was supposed to be used. You were buying it so you could have a phone, right? I mean, that's a key thing right there, right? But some of them stayed closed. Some of them stayed sealed, like sealed wax. Some of them kept them closed. So now the how iPhone much did it sell for a couple hundred bucks. You know, whatever. Well, it was how much did it sell for sealed recently? There have been a bunch of them. Thirty thousand dollars for a sealed oh. original iPhone. But why I say be careful, just as an aside, is the wrapping, the shrink wrap around the iPhone BBC. is, and that'll be next. There'll be somebody who knows that I think I can do it, blah, blah, blah. But just be careful because they could be rewrapped. It's, it does, it's not like an Apple packaging or anything on it. It's just a shrink wrap. Um, but, but the point here is that was not something people were buying to specifically hold and have an increase in value. That was something that when it came out, it was used. There's a scarcity of it that's created because it wasn't a collectible. There's a scarcity there. Now, you could have something that everyone knows is a collectible and have value because it's still going to be scarce. Use, for example, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar basketball that he used to break his his the, the scoring record himself when he broke Wilt's record, right? So look at that ball. It's uncollectible. I don't know what it's selling at. Couple hundred thousand dollars, right? I'll find it. I'll find it. Give but if you second. believe the folks from last night's game, the ball is a seven figure ball for LeBron. And the ball he ultimately uses to score his last point will also be a, uh, even more expensive. But what was 195857 So that's 195000 And I submit to you, how much are the sneakers he was wearing worth? Kareem how much are the. Kareem, how much are the nets that he was wearing? How, how much were the little seats, the little trinkets that were around? How much are all the, the things that were collected? The three different uniforms that Kareem was wearing that night? How much? No one knows. You want to know why? Because I don't think anyone harvested the nets. I think the nets stayed up and they were used for more games. And who the heck knows where they are? They're probably thrown in the garbage. And sneakers, he probably wore one pair and probably threw them out. And uniform, he probably wore one, where LeBron probably had four different ones on last night. And his his sneakers, the pink ones, everyone's talking about how much they're worth. There was a memorabilia farming that occurred last night in L.A. like no one's business, right? They'll still be worth something because people want them. But now it's big business. They're still scarce because those were the shoes. But you know what? He probably had a couple of jerseys on. And the Nets are going to be available. Kareem, you have one ball. I don't know where the nets are from that game. I don't know where his shoes are. But the one ball is worth $197,000 on market value and collectible. But somehow, the memorabilia farmed from last night's game in, 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 is worth $20 million. Think about that for a second. Think about value, scarcity, and collectability. They're not all interchangeable. I think that's another episode there, Luca Nation. You guys have... Yeah, LeBron's record. You have NBA in full swing. This is my favorite season. I've said that month. You have Super Bowl. We're going to keep the episode short for you guys. We have a pretty fun guest episode that reached out to us coming up on Friday. Oh, yeah, I'm excited. You'll have more information on the Beckett partnership. We appreciate you guys riding along um, to another year. Let's Ooh, have some I just fun. got a text message asking me if I still have my Michael Jordan PSA 10, a cash buyer looking for two if you want to entertain it. Perfect timing.